Hey, thank you for joining us and for your patience. So my name is Amanda. I work at Accounting for Nature with capacity building and advisory. And today we are running one of our method webinars where we do a deep dive into a method together with a method author. So if you haven't heard about Accounting for Nature before, we are a environmental condition, condition accounting standard. So we provide um, tools and frameworks how to measure and report on environmental condition. So if you're interested to learn more about Accounting for Nature, jump on accountingfornature.org. We schedule monthly introduction webinars to the Accounting for Nature framework. So that's a really great place to start if you want to get a quick rundown on um, the ins and outs of Accounting for Nature. With that being said, I'm going to hand over to Matt Taylor, who helped uh, write this method on mammals. And he's probably the person who's written most methods under the Accounting for Nature and has lots of experience in this space. So we'll take questions at the end through the Q&A chat box. Um, so pop any question you have in there as we go. If you think of questions after um, the webinar has ended, you can email us at info at accountingfornature.org and we will pass that email on to Matt. So thank you, Matt. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, so my name's Matt Taylor. I run an environmental consulting company called Ecotech Environmental. Um, I've just recently relocated with my family to the central Queensland coast from Tasmania. Um, I'm a, a wildlife ecologist and um, have a background working in citizen science and more recently in, in environmental accounting, working with um, Amanda and the team at, um, at Accounting for Nature to um, develop methodologies, but also to um, develop environmental accounts um, at both the project and the, and the property scale, which um, is this method is applicable to. Um, and also regional scale initiatives, um, working with the Bennett Mary Regional Group to document uh, environmental condition across a whole region. So the origin of this uh, mammal methodology, this fauna methodology, AFN fauna method 01, um, was, uh, came out of a need to sort of add to the AFN toolkit of methodologies, and it's quite a diverse toolkit these days, there's upwards of 20, 20 methods for assessing environmental condition. Um, but a couple of years ago, there, were, there weren't any fauna methods, and, and fauna, um, is a really critical element of our biodiversity in Australia. You know, we have a um, quite good uh, environmental legislation and policies in place compared to lots of parts of the world. But despite that, um, we've seen the you know the, the greatest extinction rate of mammals anywhere in the world. Thirty four species of mammals have become extinct since European settlement of the, of Australia. Uh, and, you know, those species are continuing to decline. Um, you know, uh, in, in recent years, the eastern quoll has been listed as endangered in Tasmania, where I'm from. It went from a position of being in least, uh, least concern to straight to the top of the list as endangered uh, based on um, some research that had been undertaken at the time. And so for me, that really highlights the need for actually being out there and monitoring and measuring um, you know, the fauna assemblage out there um, alongside vegetation and habitat and other kind of important biodiversity indicators. So, yeah, so the background of this method, um, it focuses on terrestrial mammal species, um, but including arboreal species, so species like possums and gliders, uh, terrestrial species, you know, macropods, uh, carnivorous species, species ranging in size from, you know, a few hundred grams up to uh, tens of tens of kilograms. Uh, the methods available um, for anyone to use free of charge. It was developed by Accounting for Nature as one of its sort of base, base methodologies, um, and it's designed to be a fairly simple tool for landholders and conservation practitioners, environmental um, environmental scientists to use to assess the condition of of um, of an assemblage of mammals in a, in a, on a property or a project um, using, you know, hands-on sort of on the ground field techniques, um, largely reliant on, on wildlife cameras, which have really revolutionized the way that we monitor 
um, wildlife and particularly mammals in, in recent years. Uh, the method does require the input of a fauna expert with local knowledge of the, um, of the fauna of an area in order to determine um, the, the species that we would expect to find in an area so that you can then calculate your condition scores by comparing what you find with um, what you would have expected to find in ideal you know, conditions or whatever. Um, and the methods applicable Australia-wide, so you can use this, um, this approach to, to develop an environmental account anywhere in Australia. And it uses you know, fairly standard techniques of, of fauna surveying, which some of you may already be familiar with. Uh, and this is a photo of um, the kind of data that you get using this method. You know, you get pictures of animals, tens of thousands of them, um, you know, often alongside lots of pictures of, of waving grass. That is one of the, the big headaches of using wildlife cameras. But, you know, in, in amongst all of that, there's often some gold. And so this is a, a Tasmanian devil from, um, from actually from my own property in Tasmania, which I've been using as a bit of a trial site when developing some of these methodologies. Um, so I'll just quickly run you through um, a bit of an overview of the, the process for developing an environmental account using this method. Um, and so, and this is all documented in, in the method, you know, in the method document. So, um, you know, everything that I'm talking to today um, is really clearly spelled, spelled out in a step-by-step -step, um, fashion that you can follow through as basically like a set of a, a recipe for producing an environmental account, if you like. So the first step is, um, is this sort of scoping exercise where you're defining the purpose of your account, um, identifying the kinds of assets that you want to monitor. This can you know, um, include other assets, not just fauna, um, and, and, and picking the area that you're going to be um, you know, documenting the condition of using the AFN framework. The next step is, um, is really around sort of planning the um, the sampling and survey design. So the term stratification is used as a way of actually um, dividing the landscape up into sensible units of assessment or measurement. And that can be based on different kinds of habitat that might be present for fauna. Um, it might be based around different uh, approaches to, to how you manage your land. So there might be a conservation area on a property um, where the management's different to an area where there's grazing. Um, you might have rainforest in small pockets of your property which is different to grassy woodlands that occur on the rest of your property. Um, so that, that process, there's guidance around how to do that. Um, and it's a really critical part to making sure that you document the full kind of breadth of, of fauna that occurs on a property. Third step is um, describing the indicators and determining the reference benchmarks or the reference list of species that you would expect to find on a property. Um, the, the fourth step, is the bit that most people kind of think about when they're um, thinking about, you know, undertaking a survey of fauna, which is collecting and analysing the data. Um, and that's the, that's the fun bit, you know, getting out there and, um, and exploring a property and um, finding locations where you think fauna are going to be, setting up cameras and then, you know, capturing that really rich data set of uh, the comings and goings of all of the species that are there. Um, and then step five is going through um, and calculating the condition metrics that the AFN framework is based around. Um, and step six is the final, final step where you're um, calculating the econ, which gives you sort of a headline score of how well your fauna are faring on your property um, or in, on your project area. And, you know, and that's um, an index that is um, rates condition on a scale from zero to 100, where zero is the absence of that environmental asset completely, in this sense it would be no fauna at all, um, and 100 being that every species you would expect to find on the property is there. Um, and just a brief note here that uh, there is a degree of expert um, experience required um, when doing some of these, these stages. So step two, where you're um, defining your account area and setting up your sampling and your sampling units it requires some expert expertise in, uh, in GIS, in mapping. And um, steps three and steps four require someone who has like a good working knowledge of the fauna of an area um, because um, fauna are uniformly distributed across the landscape. Um, 
some species are habitat specialists and so depending on the habitat within an area you might expect different a different assemblage of species so just uh going through those steps now in a little bit more detail um, to start with talking about the, the purpose and, and scope of your environmental account so the scope um, of a, of a fauna-centric environmental account is these terrestrial and arboreal mammals that, that I mentioned. Um, and uh, this environmental account is, uh, this environmental accounting methodology um, is designed to produce level three accounts. So AFN has um, a, a tiered system of um, sort of confidence, statistical confidence in the results of an account. The level three is the sort of the most basic entry level um, tier. And we've designed this method deliberately that way to try and keep things as simple as possible with the idea that, um, you know, landholders um, and community groups and people like that can, um, can get on board with a relatively simple way of assessing fauna condition without um, diving into the details of um, complex modeling um, and without, you know, having to um, invest a huge amount of resources in capturing the condition of fauna. Um, as I mentioned, the, the accounts, um, the methods are applicable to um, a property scale. Um, so a property might range in size from tens to thousands of hectares and similarly project scales. So um, environmental groups undertaking a specific project um, who want um, fauna to be one of the indicators of success of that project. Um, could use this method at a project scale. Um, the method uh, detects changes in species richness and composition. So basically, um, it's, a, at the, it's the most basic way of assessing fauna, which species are there as a simple presence or absence um, measure of, um, of fauna condition. So you can see which types of species are there and, and what the diversity of fauna is on a property. Um, but note that it doesn't measure abundance um, and it doesn't um, measure occupancy. So they're more sophisticated um, measures of, of fauna condition, but uh, in order to develop an account using that sort of approach um, is significantly more complicated. So we've kind of quite deliberately kept this one as simple as we could. And that uh, photo there is a photo of um, Gundicum Station. So this was the first property where this method was trialed. It's a, an amazing property in Monto, about uh, 200 kilometres west of where I am here in central Queensland. Um, the property is centred around a, um, an extinct volcano and it's got rocky gorges and grassy woodlands and um, uh, brush-tailed rock wallabies and betongs and bandicoots and dingoes and this fantastic um, assemblage of fauna uh, managed by Robin Nadia Campbell. And it was a really fantastic sort of test case for, um, you know, using this method first time around. So step two is stratification. And so this is where you um, look at a property or project area and, um, and, and look at maps and look at satellite imagery and try and identify specific habitat types or management um, zones that might have bearing on the types of species that would occur here. So this is again an example from Gundicum. Um, and so showing the tracks around the property and showing the types of habitat that are present there on the property. So there's areas of cleared land which have, um, have got pasture for cattle grazing. Uh, you can see the property is largely grassy woodlands, um, managed again, you know, more or less uniformly for, for cattle grazing. Uh, there's rocky outcrops. These are the gorges that I mentioned that um, provide specific habitat for brush-tailed rock wallabies. Um, if the property didn't have those rocky gorges, if it was just a you know, flat land with um, grassy woodland from you know boundary to boundary, then you wouldn't expect to find brush-tailed rock wallabies there. So this sort of stratification step can really have bearing on the kinds of species that you would be expecting and how you calculate condition. And you can also see that um, there's small patches of rainforest 
and that's uh, you know so it's not, it's largely a dry environment there, sort of um, approaching the Great Dividing Range, and so these um, little pockets of rainforest are occurring in south facing slopes and, and wet areas, and can provide a refugia for um, for certain types of species that might not have not occurred there otherwise. So we basically divided up the, the sampling approach based on those habitat types, making sure that we allocated samples to all of those different areas to make sure that we maximise the chance of detecting all of the species that actually occur there. We don't want to be missing species because false negatives impact on your condition score, um, reduce the, you know, the accuracy of your account. The next step is defining indicators and, and reference benchmarks. So indicators are different for different methods. Um, the indicators of condition for vegetation or for another fauna group would be quite different. Um, it differs from method to method. Um, and same with the reference benchmarks. So for this method, um, as I mentioned, the, the indicator of condition is, is species richness. So um, the number of species that you've detected on your property, um, and that's compared to the number of species that you would have expected to um, have found in that location in historic, you know, pre-European times. Um, and so the, the approach to um, determining the reference benchmark for, um, for a property or a project location is to, to start off um, reviewing um, the species distribution maps. So as part of the, the project where we developed this method, um, we reviewed a, a range of different sources, but primarily um, a, a publication by Andrew Bird, Burbage and John Wynarski from 2009, where they um, produced maps of all of the fauna species, mammal species in Australia, 300 odd species. Um, they reviewed historical records, they interviewed traditional owners, um, you know, out in remote communities, they, inter they um, interviewed uh, pastoralists and, you know, knowledgeable elders of communities around Australia uh, to, um, and then more recent, you know, modern data sets to try and piece together um, the, the distribution of all of our fauna in pre-European times. It's an amazing resource, and we AFNs pulled that together into a GIS layer, uh, where for each of um, Australia's um, bioregions, the the Ibra subregions, we have a species list of the species that you would expect to find in that region. So that's a really good starting point in terms of knowing where you might, what species might occur in a project area, um, but. Um, as I mentioned it before, when we were looking at the stratification, um, species can be habitat specialists. And so just because a species occurred, it was known to have occurred in a region, doesn't mean that it would necessarily occur on a property or within a project area if the, the habitat is absent. And so that's where you need to sort of take this long list of species that might occur in, a, in an area and then refine that through discussions with a local fauna expert um, who would be knowledgeable about the kinds of species that might occur in that area. Um, and this example here, this map, um, just shows an output of that, that GIS layer, that mapping layer that, um, that AFN can provide on request. And it shows the locations where Eastern Quoll had been historically recorded around Australia, um, including the location where they um, are still currently known to exist. So, um, you can see from this that eastern quolls used to occur um, throughout sort of southeastern corner of Australia, um, but you know have um, have declined due to primarily to, to foxes and, and predation um, by cats. Um, you know are now restricted to to Tasmania, and you know even in Tasmania they're still continuing to decline and they're now listed as endangered. And so this is the, the species list from Gundicum, um, the, the reference species list. And so we started off looking at that map, um, that, those maps um, of the region, of the bioregion, and we produced a long list and 
and it had, um, I think, 36 species of mammals that occur within that region. And then from that, we reduced it to this list, which is the species that are likely or somewhat likely to occur on the property. And so uh, this is a way of taking into account the fact that some species can be uncommon or, um, or it's uncertain whether they might occur in an area. And so for species where it's, um, there's some uncertainty, then those, um, when, when developing your, um, your measure of richness of a, um, for a project area, you actually can downweight some of those species. And so species like feather tail glider and northern foal, spotted tail foal, northern brown bandicoot, um, there was some uncertainty um, around whether or not these species would occur in that, in that area, whether they would be detected by a survey. And so we downweighted those so that the failure to detect those species had less of an impact on the, um, the overall conditions score. Um, so, yeah, so just going through Gundicum, I guess, as a, as a bit of a, um, an example of the, um, of how this reference benchmarks determine. It started off with 36 species. There was no suitable habitat for three species, the um, required swamps. And there were, was no habitat for nine species that preferred much more open habitat. So grasslands and, and, um, and, and more, more like desert country, which is present uh, in the Western, um, part of the bioregion. So we excluded those from our list and we, we ended up with that list of the 24 species here, which is then sort of further defined by the likelihood of those species being present. And you can see from the map um, where we allocated our sample locations in order to try and uh, pick up some of that diversity of habitats that was present on the property. So uh, the next step of the process is collecting and analyzing data. So again, in order to minimize the chance of, of false negatives of failing to detect a species, even when it's there, um, we recommend setting up uh, three cameras per monitoring location. Um, they don't have to be all right next to each other. So this is a bit of an example of how you might deploy um, some wildlife cameras to pick up um, that, that diversity of species that might be expected at that location. So setting up, um, in, you know, assuming it's a, a forest or woodland environment, then setting up a camera that targets arboreal mammals. Um, you might set that up in a location that's different to a location um, with a camera targeting smaller ground-dwelling mammals that are likely to be um, hanging around in areas where there's um, dense ground cover. Um, and then setting up a, a third camera for um, medium or larger animals that might be moving through um, the landscape, um, wider ranging species typically that um, you might set up a camera um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a track that you can see is being used by, by many species. Um, and this really maximizes the chance that you'll detect all of the species that are using a site. There's no trees, there's no point in setting up a camera for arboreal species, obviously. Uh, and, and this is um, now sort of going through some of the ways that you can set up a wildlife camera to, um, to detect those species. So this is this first diagram is sort of a really typical um, camera rig. You can either attach a camera to a steel um, star picket um, and use a wooden block to, to angle the camera um, towards the ground. Or if there's, if there's um, a suitable tree available in a location or a fence post, then that can also be a good um, place to anchor the camera. Using star pickets with a bracket, um, has the advantage that you can actually really choose the location where that camera goes so that you can target an area where you can see the signs of activity of wildlife. Um, so the equipment required is a wildlife camera. Um, and if people um, are interested in, in um, recommendations for wildlife cameras, I can, can recommend the cameras that, that we use for our surveys. 
I can and, um, put you in touch with suppliers down like after the after the session. Um, so you need a camera, obviously, and a strap for strapping it to something. Um, duct tape can help to really make sure that that's the cam that camera is secure. Um, a steel post can give you flexibility around where you're setting the camera up. A wooden bracket can help to um, adjust the camera's angle. And then we use a fish oil lure to um, to draw cameras in um, wildlife into the um, the field of view. Um, peanut oil can work as well. Um, you can also set up cameras without any lure, uh, but um, you know sort of trials have shown that the, the chances of detection of wildlife without a law are much, much lower. Um, bear in mind that if you are using a law, depending on the jurisdiction that you're um, operating in and depending on um, the purpose of your um, survey, then you may require um, a permit from um, a government regulator to, to undertake those surveys. Uh, and it's different for different jurisdictions. So uh, in Tasmania, um, the regulations were recently changed so that if you're using a law, um, you need to get a permit because it's changing the, the behaviour of animals. So you need to get an ethics permit, but that's generally a fairly um, streamlined and low cost process um, to get those permits. The time required per site is typically around 30 minutes to set up a site. Um, and then there's some some standard camera settings that we use, uh, you know, setting the date and time um, so that you know when each image was <coughs> was taken. Um, setting the camera so that it takes three photos per trigger to maximise the chance that when an animal uh, goes in front of the camera that you get a photo from which that animal can be identified. You know, often um, with a single photo, you might only get, you know, a, um, a view of the back of an animal or part of an animal, which makes ID difficult. We set um, the cameras to um, take photos every 45 seconds if an animal is still in front of the camera, um, triggering, triggering the sensor. And that's to avoid um, animals just sort of parking themselves in front of a camera and taking you know, thousands of photos of themselves just sort of having a scratch or whatever. Um, and, and we also set the image size to low, you know, the, the typical wildlife cameras now are still, even on a low setting, are taking a, a fairly um, high resolution image. And it's just to maximise the amount of time that camera can be deployed without the, the memory card being filled up. And setting up, um, you know, cameras like this, you know, anyone can do it. I've run citizen science projects with volunteers and landholders for, the, for many years. Um, and with, you know, a basic set of instructions, people can be um, out there and collecting data about their properties um, really easily. And, um, yeah, often... Um, I've been observing wildlife for years and I'll have a really good um, sense of where, you know, wildlife are going to be. And so tapping into that local knowledge can actually be really valuable. Um, to target smaller mammals, um, it can help to, to um, put the camera closer to the ground. And the reason for that is that, you know, um, you know, lots of the small mammals look quite similar. And so being able to um, actually bring them in closer to the camera can be valuable for making identifications. Um, but otherwise, you know, the camera setup is, is largely the same. Um, again, you can stick it on the, the base of a, a tree or something like that if there's a, um, a suitable spot for the camera um, or use a, um, use a star picket. Um, and you can also use wildlife cameras to pick up arboreal species and the gunda can be picked up. Raider gliders, feather tail gliders, um, and even, um, yeah, you know, um, you know, possums and goannas and snakes and things like that that are using the trees. So um, this setup we found to be quite good where you've basically got a, um, a camera about you know sort of between five and ten meters away from from a tree with a with a feed station attached to that tree um, and we 
used um, maple syrup um, at the recommendation of um, Rob Campbell, who's been monitoring um, arboreal species on their property for a long time. They've got a, um, an orphan wildlife rehabilitation centre there. And Rob um, swears that um, gliders are much more likely to come in if you're using authentic Canadian maple syrup compared to any other sugary substance. Uh, something about the, the fact that it's a, a sap rather than a, um, an artificial sugar, um, yet a better head rate. I haven't experimented that much with alternatives, but um, certainly we were successful at picking up um, some, you know, um, rare and, you know, pretty cryptic species using this technique. Um, you can use a, a star picket again, or, uh, you know, um, often you'll find a pair of trees that, that will um, form a suitable um, sort of combination where you can mount the camera on one tree and the bracket on another. Um, and, and with all of these methods, um, you really kind of need to, I guess, put yourself in the mindset of the fauna that you're um, trying to survey for. Just going and sticking a camera up on any tree is not necessarily going to yield results. You want to look for signs of activity. Um, same goes for, for the ground dwelling animals. You need to be it being observant and actually looking around in an area to see where animals are um, spending time and where there's activity. And so for arboreal species, there might be droppings underneath a tree, there might be scratches um, where they've been climbing the tree, there might be um, places where they've been gnawing into the tree to, um, to get sap running. Um, and so, you know, um, it's important to, to actually spend some time and have a good think about where the fauna are likely to be in the landscape because that can be really hard to detect otherwise. Um, and so once you've set your cameras out, um, you typically leave them in the field for, for three weeks and go and gather them up again. And when you've got all of your cameras back, um, you'll discover that you've got thousands of photos of, of wildlife. Um, and, you know, usually lots of photos of moving grass and leaves. Uh, the cameras, the one sort of failing of them is that they're too sensitive usually. Um, and so um, that, you know, big um, data set that you've got there um, it captures all of the comings and goings of, um, of fauna species, which is sort of, um, you know, above and beyond the amount of information you necessarily require to produce an environmental account using this method. Um, but there's some really um, great systems out there for actually managing um, camera trapping data sets and also automating um, some of the analysis. And I thought I might just um, stop sharing this presentation and jump onto one of them, which I use, which is called Wildlife Insights. And Wildlife Insights was developed by the Smithsonian Institute and the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund, some of these big international not-for-profits to try and make it easier to manage camera trapping projects. Um, and what it does is it allows you to upload your images to, to their platform and then it's got an, um, an, an AI recognizer built into the system that will automatically go through and um, filter out all of the photos that don't have any animals in them and then go through and highlight um, the animals that, um, the photos that, the locations of animals in photos that, um, you know, that it can de detect through that process. Um, and given enough training data, it'll actually, um, you know, um, give a potential identification of the species as well. Um, in Australia, the program hasn't been um, as widely used yet as it has been in the US and Africa, um, where people have contributed um, by manually tagging the identification of images, sort of thousands of um, photos of all of the different kind of fauna species there. And so um, with that sort of training data set, you can end up getting um, levels of accuracy um, in identification of wildlife that actually exceed the accuracy of volunteers. Um, but in Australia, um, by you know um, involving yourself in wildlife insights, you're actually starting to contribute that training data set. Um, you know the, the software needs 
hundreds or thousands of photos of each species to be able to accurately identify it. And so as part of a, you know, contributing to a, a global program of um, trying to make monitoring wildlife more efficient. So just bear with me now while I jump off the screen share on this and go to wildlife. Lessons. New wildlife insights. So can everyone see that? Yes. Um, so I'll just take you back to the, the start of it. Um, so with this with this platform, you need to register an account and a project to be able to manage your own kind of camera trading trapping data sets. Um, but once the the data is up there, then it's actually contributing to um, you know global understandings of how wildlife populations are faring. And there's projects all over the all over the world, and you can sort of explore the data um, of different projects in your area. And so, if you're looking in Australia, you know people are using this, this um, platform all over the place. Um, but you know countries like the US. There's hundreds of projects that have been up and running for, you know, some of them for decades. And so there's just, um, you know, a greater training data set and the, the models that help identify animals um, in some parts of the world are more accurate than others. But you can see all of these projects all going through and tagging their wildlife images are all helping, helping make it work better um, in Australia. And probably one of my projects is in here as well. Anyway, we'll, um, I'll just sort of take you into the, the back end of it now just so you can see what it looks like. And so it's got a system here for um, basically creating um, projects that, you know, um, this is sort of the, the metadata or the information about your project and what you're sort of surveying and, and why you're surveying it. Um, but once you've got a project registered, then you can upload images from your computer to, to the cloud, um, which then enables either yourself or volunteers or other people involved in your project to um, contribute to it. Um, and then uh, once you've got your images um, uploaded to, to the platform, you can go through and identify um, the wildlife images that are in um, in those in those locations. And each of the locations has got a um, a geolocation, so it's sort of mapping it for you. And then um, yeah, and then it basically goes through and calculates a bunch of statistics around the distribution and abundance of different species in your location. And so here's one of the series of images that was taken from one of the projects I'm working on using this method called the coin, which is in uh, the Midlands area of Tasmania. And here are some pictures of a Tasmanian devil that we've uploaded by the looks of things. And it's taking a while to load. But here it's basically gone, that's where your animal is. And then here on the right hand side, it's um, having a guess about what species it thinks it is. And it said, as a mammal, 69% confident that it's a mammal, and it's 68% confident that it's a cat. So it's obviously not seen enough photos of Tasmanian devils to be able to recognize that from a cat. Um, but to um, edit that identification, I'll search for an animal and my name devil and I'll add that animal there save changes and so that tags it as a um as a Tasmanian devil and you know the more times we do that the more accurate that model will become at um ID'ing the animals so uh there's other platforms 
out there that are, and systems and processes for dealing with wildlife um, image data. Um, but this is this is my favourite. Um, yeah, and I'd encourage you to use it if you want to find out more about how to um, to register projects and, and um, get involved with it. You can either contact me, or there's some really great um, tutorials and learning resources um, as part of this program. You know, it's a big um, worldwide citizen science project, basically, um, and they're developing you know these really fantastic tools to help help with this type of project. So let's go back to my presentation now. Um, yeah, so yeah, if you haven't been involved in doing wildlife camera work, you sort of probably won't have a sense of just how prolific these things can be in producing data. So these kinds of tools like Wildlife Insights really help streamline that analysis part of the process. Um, but once you've gone through and ID'd all of your, your wildlife from your camera trapping data set, uh, then the next step is to go through and calculate some um, condition scores. And so, you know, again, this method is um, fairly sim deliberately simplistic. We're just basically looking at presence or absence of these different species, these different species that you would expect to find in a, in a location. And so here we've been through and we got most of the species that we would have expected to see at Gundicum, which is highly unusual on mainland Australia, you know, really um, the, the mammal fauna of Australia. Um, in, in most most areas has um, declined massively, you know, due to land clearing and habitat degradation and um, and particularly due to invasive species like foxes um, and rats and cats and all of those sorts of things, um, cane toads in Northern Australia. And so the species that we, we missed in at Kundakum were the Northern Quoll and the Spotted Tail Quoll. So the northern quolls declined, you know, both of these species have declined massively on mainland Australia. Um, the northern quoll, we would have been right on the southern end of its, its range at Gundicum, um, didn't pick it up, likely it might have been rare there anyway. Um, spotted tail quolls, they're sort of naturally in low densities in the landscape, unsurprising to not pick those species up. Um, but, you know, um, you know, additional surveys, they, they may or may not, um, may not turn up. Uh, and we didn't pick up yellow belly gliders, which you know, this is a, um, an interesting finding because um, they have been recorded on the property in the past. So there's always an element of randomness in any kind of data set in that you're not always necessarily going to pick up every species every time. Um, same goes for squirrel glider. Um, they set up um, some wildlife cameras only maybe a couple of months after this and picked up squirrel gliders, um, but we didn't get them in this survey. So they don't go into the calculations. Um, Brush-tailed Pascagao and ring-tailed possums were also missed. Um, but we picked up all of these other species, which is really fantastic um, result for the Um, You know, for a working cattle station to still have a largely intact fauna is fantastic. So here's um, our measure of reference richness, which is what we would have expected to find on the property. Um, Pre-1750, um, and, and they, bear in mind these scores are weighted by that likelihood factor, likelihood of occurrence. Um, and then this is our observed richness, again, weighted by that likelihood of occurrence. And gives you an overall econ of 80, 82, which is, you know, outstanding really um, to, to get a, a score as good as that for, um, for a property that's managed at the cattle station. Um, yeah, so that's basically how you calculate the econ. You know, it's um, it's a measure across the entire property um, of the you know, the proportion of species you observe compared to how many you would have expected to find there. It's sort of as simple as that. And finally, you um, document all of these findings, including the the process that you went through in terms of that sort of stratification and um, identifying your reference species list in an environmental account. Um, and those are a few bullet points that have nothing to do with that. Um, 
Yeah, so this is the Gundicum environmental account, um, and, and that's a really kind of valuable, um, you know, public document which um, can, you know, explain to people the condition of an area, a property or a project, um, but also explain all of the, the steps that you went through to, to get to that point. And so that's the really, I guess, valuable element of the Accounting for Nature framework is that transparency that, you know, these um, environmental accounts are um, independently reviewed prior to verification or certification, um, but they're also required, you're also required to basically um, explain how you, um, you, you got the results that you did um, and also present all of the, you know, the data that, that contributed towards your environmental account. And so, um, you know, I guess for me, that's the strength of, of using this, this framework is that you, um, you know, you can have this, this um, trustworthiness in it that when you're presenting your findings that people can see how you've got those results and, and, and um, with the expectation that it's been reviewed as well. Um, yeah, so I've got a few minutes for questions if anyone's got any questions. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, so if anyone does have questions, please pop them into the q and I'll also mention for anyone who jumped on late that the session is recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you need to catch up on any part of the session afterwards, um, please go and visit our YouTube site. It should be up by tomorrow. So whilst people might be typing away, I thought I would start with the first question, if that's okay, Matt. Yep. Um, so if you, during your survey period, managed to capture photos of wildlife species that aren't necessarily caught on the wildlife cameras, so if you have your own camera and is able to capture a photograph of a species, could that be included towards your econ calculation? Um, so just to make sure I got that right. So if you're, say you're out setting wildlife cameras and a beton goes running past, but then you don't get it on your wildlife camera. Can you count it? Yes. Um, yeah, the the, the answer is no. Those sort of ad hoc and incidental observations, um, at present, the way that the method's written, um, no, they're not. And I mean, the reason for that is that you're trying to in, introduce a measure of standardization or consistency in the survey effort so that you can compare um, the results from one property to the results from another or the results from one year to the results of another. And so by including um, those incidental observations, you can actually skew those results. There might be one landholder who spends all their time in the bush, sees everything and, you know, and that's great. That's really a valuable um, source of knowledge about the property, um, but um, it's a separate exercise to documenting condition in an account where you're aiming for consistency. Um, and so you don't want to um, bias that by um, then going and looking at another property where someone might be time poor or they have a, a manager there or, you know, they, they might be, you know, not um, have as good eyesight or there might be a whole range of reasons why people might not be able to make those same incidental observations. So it wouldn't make for a level playing field. That is a very good reasoning um, time. I've just got a, a question from Eliza around camera recommendations. Um, and yeah, um, the cameras which I use um, are Swift Enduros. And so they're, um, I guess, a relatively low cost camera in the, in the scheme of, um, of cameras. Um, the sort of the, the most expensive and top of the range cameras can cost upwards of $1,000 per camera. The Swift Enduro, um, costs around three hundred dollars, and they produce really crisp, clear images. Um, and they, um, and so I mean that's one really important consideration with a camera, um, because you can't identify images if the um, animals if the images are blurry, particularly for smaller animals. So they they do a, a really good job of capturing a crisp image. Um, they also. Um, lost my train of thought here. Oh, they, um, the, the sensors are not crazily oversensitive. And so where some cameras, you might set them up and they'll just be taking photos all day long of, of grass moving or shadows. 
you can end up with for every photo of wildlife, you end up, might end up with hundreds of photos of, um, of those false triggers. And so swift enduros are actually quite good at reducing the amount of false triggers. Um, but you know, further to that point, they um, they're actually really reliable at detecting species. So when um, when I've um, gone through and purchased a new um, batch of, of cameras, which happens every now and then, then um, I've typically tested cameras against each other to see how they perform before purchasing dozens of them. And yeah, the Swift Enduros um, and, and universities do the same thing. Sometimes there'll be like hundreds of cameras. And so you want to make sure that um, the cameras are, are going to be working how you want them to. Um, and, and testing um, that lots of people have undertaken have found that they're as good at picking up wildlife as those more expensive cameras. So what it means is that if you've got a fixed budget for your project or whatever, um, you can actually get more cameras out on the ground, which will give you a better, richer data set for your money rather than going for the really expensive cameras. So with regards to that, knowing that cameras can often be um, a costly part of implementing this, is there any organisations that landholders might be able to contact to borrow cameras? Yeah, that's a really good question, Amanda. Um, I think most of the, the there's different organisations in different parts of Australia that um, that run citizen science and monitoring programs. So in Tasmania, um, the program I set up in my previous role with the Tasmanian Land Conservancy is ongoing. It's called Wild Tracker, and so that's a program for landholders to to get involved in wildlife monitoring and capture wildlife on their properties. Um, you can borrow a camera, you can attend a, a training workshop and, and, and contribute to a sort of a bigger project. And there's projects like that in, in different parts of Australia run by um, Parks and Wildlife Services and um, often local land care groups or, um, or NRM regions will have, um, have cameras. And so it's worth reaching out through your networks to start with to see whether or not you can access some cameras. Um, because unless you're you know, um, a professional wildlife ecologist, then it's likely that you'll have cam camera, a camera, to, if you bought a camera to do an environmental account, it, um, you wouldn't necessarily be using it, you know, all year round. And so um, it's good to, yes, yeah, sort of share that pooled resource. There's also companies that actually rent cameras out as well. So um, some of the suppliers will also rent, rent cameras for, to people for projects. Great. Thank you, Matt. Doesn't look like we have any more questions in, oh, actually we do. I just wrote another one um, saying, but choosing monitoring sites you aim is to increase the likelihood you'll catch something. So you want to best yeah. possible potential spots. That's, ex that's exactly right. Um, there's often a, a tendency for people to be overly scientific about um, wildlife surveys and um, and just pick random locations. But really, um, if you know your property or your area and you know you know wildlife, you want to make use of that knowledge about the ecology of these species to actually target your surveys effectively. And so um, when I um, start a new project, I always go out and, and do a, a preliminary survey of a property, just get to know that property or that location and get a sense of the habitats that are there, walk around and see where there's activity. It's, you know, wildlife are typically um, more likely to be occurring around um, water. Um, it's one sort of thing that can draw species in. Um, and there's signs of wildlife, you know, everywhere in the landscape if, you, if you're observant in terms of things like diggings and tracks, scratches on trees, those kinds of things. And so if it's, a, if it's an area or a property that you're familiar with, um, then you might already know the best locations to get get wildlife. Um, and so yeah, by all means target those those places because it can be really hit and miss. There can be species that you see regularly. Um, and if you set up a camera in a in a location that's not well thought through, then you know you'll you'll miss it. And that's the last thing you want to do is, you know, um, have an absence of, of of data that could be helping to inform your management. And um, um, as a non-wildlife expert, I'm guessing that the way you would go about your sampling would be different if you were trying to estimate population versus just absence or presence. Yeah, that's right. So to be able to estimate um, abundance and get measures of population size changes, 
um, you typically need to use orders of magnitude more surveys. So um, to do occupancy modeling, you need um, a lot of cameras out there on the ground to be able to get that sort of robust statistical measures. Um, and for species such as um, things like Tasmanian devils or cats or quolls, um, with distinctive markings, you can do sort of a, a capture mark recapture. You can identify individuals and estimate abundance that way, but it's complicated and it's difficult. And um, and for most landholders and smaller projects, it's um, it's you know not normally feasible. Um, it's typically from from larger projects that um, that you you'd go down that pathway, um, but. That being said, um, this still yields um, some really valuable data. From each of those cameras, you'll get a list of the species that are occurring in that location. So you'll get a good sense of where species are. And just knowing what's on a property or project area is a really valuable first step um, towards managing that area. Um, yeah, you know, um, you can make the assumption that if you're picking up um, wildlife from a limited survey that they're there, that there'll be a population there. Um, and if you want to go to the next step and actually really target that species, then, then there's ways of doing that, but it's sort of outside the scope of this method. Thank you. So we might wrap up the session for today. Thank you, Matt, so much for joining us. And if you guys have any questions about the method, um, shoot us an email at info at accountingfornature.org and we will pass them on to Matt. So thank you and have a lovely rest of the day, everyone. Thanks everyone.